Nightcast. Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth brings you the current news from the world today and how it relates to Bible prophecy. Understanding the end time events leading to the peaceful world tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth. Good evening, friends. Welcome to this Monday night, October 12, 2015 edition of Nightcast. The Prime Minister of Turkey has said the investigation into the bomb attacks during a peace rally in Ankara is focusing on so-called Islamic State militants. The authorities say 97 people were killed in the bombings on Saturday, but pro-Kurdish activists said the figure was much higher. Some of the mourners have expressed anger towards the government. The BBC's Middle East editor, Jeremy Bowen, reports from Ankara. Uyghur Joshkin's wife grieved for him and for small and precious moments in the life they had. The toy he bought for our son is still there, she said. They'll never be able to play together now. Oiga Joshkin was a lawyer, 32 years old, and his son is three. His wife, Metap, is also a lawyer. They too were more than husband and wife. They were partners. They were lovers. They were friends. The head of Turkey's Bar Association knew the couple. He's one of the government's most prominent critics. The government is in the end responsible for not taking enough precautions, for polarizing the society, for being so tolerant towards ISIS, and for interfering Syria's internal affairs. The people of Ankara, Turkey's capital, like the rest of the country, are shocked, angry, and divided. They want to know who killed so many people. The main railway station where the bombing happened is working, a normal timetable, but not a normal life. <laughs> this was a few minutes after the attack on Saturday. Turkey was in crisis before it happened. Tense police clashed briefly with angry survivors. National unity is a memory. The Prime Minister Ahmet Davutoglu rejects accusations that the government bears any responsibility for the killing. On Turkish TV, he said the jihadists of Islamic State were the prime suspects. But the banner at yet another funeral says the murderous state. Grief is suffused with politics. What happens in Turkey matters because of the country's position between Europe and the turbulent Middle East, because it's deeply involved in the war in Syria, and because as well, it's so divided. The bombings have reawakened memories of devastating political violence at the end of the 20th century and have deepened the divisions in what is already a very fractured country. This was the last of Ali Kitabshi, a trade union leader. His wife Emel said goodbye with the clenched fist of the left, just one of many groups that feel pushed out by 13 years of religious nationalism. Emil said, my comrade, I salute you a thousand times. So many personal tragedies add up to much more than domestic trouble. The Middle East is pouring blood into a homegrown crisis, and Turkey, the West's vital ally, is struggling. Jeremy Bowen, BBC News, Ankara. And friends, just a reminder on who's who. Turkey is modern-day Edom, or Esau, who was a brother to Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Jacob had a brother named Esau, who's also called Edom. And 
Esau, the modern day descendants of Esau are the people of Turkey today. That makes the people of Turkey in relation to um, the tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, 13 if you count Ephraim and Manasseh, the two half tribes separately, as they are counted separately in the lost 10 tribes. But uh, focusing on the majority of you who watch this program are from the United States, from the UK, some from France, some from a few other parts, but some even from China, but the bulk from the UK and the US, and some few in France, Reuben, Brother Reuben. <clears throat> but uh, among the UK, Ephraim, and the US, Manasseh, <clears throat> the relationship between the United States, the UK, France even, the relationship to us as brothers, as sons of Jacob, sons of Israel, our relationship would be that of a nephew to an uncle, uncle Uncle Esau, Uncle Edom, <clears throat> Turkey, modern-day Turkey. They are our uncle on the one hand. On the other hand, <clears throat> if you consider the fact that Ephraim and Manasseh, the two sons of Joseph, step into the shoes of Joseph, um, <clears throat> Joseph kind of carries, well, actually all the sons carry the name Israel. But if you move it up a notch, Israel and whose name was Jacob before God changed it to Israel. Israel, or Jacob, is on par with Esau relationship-wise. They were brothers. So in one sense, you might say the modern-day descendants of Esau or Edom, the people of Turkey, are our brothers over there. Um, wait a minute. Let's see. No, they'd be our cousins, wouldn't they? Um, yeah, those of us who are the sons of Jacob, uh, the sons, the modern day sons of Esau, well, you, you know, it might be best just to call them cousins, but very technically, Uncle Esau or Uncle Edom is our uncle, is the uncle of the tribes of Israel. He's the great uncle of Ephraim and Manasseh, except that Ephraim and Manasseh, Ephraim and Manasseh actually uh, received a double portion, and they step into the shoes of Joseph when you consider relationships. So, um, people of Turkey, we're the nephew, they're the uncle, or as you go through the descendants, we're cousins. That's our cousin, cousins in Turkey. And as Jeremy Bowen pointed out, that situation over there, Turkey, very important to what's going on. They're involved in Syria. They're a central point uh, between the countries of Europe. And uh, what happens with Turkey has a great deal to do with how Europe will shape as it shapes into eventually... Well, let's come out for a second. Before we go to the next two stories, we have light news tonight, so I'm going to come in early and comment if uh, <clears throat> if we get my buttons to work we'll see how come these buttons aren't working over here let's try it again ah, there we go now uh, if we go to um, um, <clears throat> I was going to point out now you know our news stories relate to the seals from the book of Revelation that Jesus Christ described in plain language and Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and this story tonight relates more to the fourth seal than to the second seal because of the internal strife. That makes it more like mobs and seditions, which Jesus Christ referred to by the term tarake, meaning trouble, roiling waters, literally and figuratively, figuratively in the sense of mobs and seditions that would well, that would cause death. And here we got 95 people that have been killed, others injured in this incident, in this first report tonight that's uh, of the bombing that happened on Saturday. And 
That's the third thing that Jesus Christ mentioned as part of the fourth seal, or at least activities between the third and fifth seal. That only leaves the position of the fourth seal. The main thing Christ said that there would happen with the fourth seal. Now, the fourth seal in Revelation is depicted by a pale horse who has a rider whose name is Death, alongside whom rides Hades, or Hell, the grave. And... Christ in plain language. You can see at the bottom of this fourth column over here where it says pale, number four, pale, fourth seal, pale horse, rider named death, ridden alongside Hades, hell, the grave. He said the primary thing of this seal would be uh, death by loimus, meaning death by pestilence, disease epidemics, the plagues of Egypt. But you can see next under that the word seismos. He also said there would be seismic activity, commotions in the air, gale force winds of all kinds, commotions on the ground, such as earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, tsunamis, wildfires, floodings, etc. And there would be tarake, trouble, roiling waters, mobs, seditions, trouble that is not the mega trouble of the fifth seal, the next major event in prophecy, but trouble that leads up to the mega trouble that leads up to and the mega trouble the great tribulation begins when the seventh head of the holy roman empire is restored that's the time of the great tribulation and that's the next major event next thing that's going to happen is <clears throat> indirectly what Jeremy Bowen was referring to, as he said, Syria, very important to how Europe shapes up, and it's right in the middle of them, and they're involved in Syria. And uh, eventually, the nations of Europe will shape into five kings from the east, five kings from the west, whether that means uh, countries as we now know them are suddenly overnight rebordered with somehow the Pope being involved and saying, hey, we're going to reborder uh, uh, this country to include a couple other countries, however it's done, and this person will be the head of it, you know, and those ten will give their power to one dictator, one emperor, who the Pope will crown in a coronation ceremony held in Frankfurt, Germany, in the Romer building up on the second floor where the Kaiser's Hall, the Emperor's Hall, has been rebuilt following its destruction toward the end of World War II. Rebuilt thanks to the American taxpayers and the Marshall Fund. And it's all ready now for this coronation ceremony to be held that will restore the Holy Roman Empire for its seventh and final time with a seventh head that the Bible calls the Beast. Let's, let's zoom out for a moment. As long as we are uh, in a pause between the last couple of stories I'll play tonight, let's pull out and go into the photographs here on the wall over my shoulder. And you'll see right in the middle of that, <coughs> toward the bottom, there is a, a crown right in the middle of uh, this photograph. This is a photograph of the crown of the Holy Roman Empire. Now, once this, this crown is presently on display in the royal treasury in Vienna. And, excuse me, folks, I keep having to cut off my mic for a moment because I have caught just a little bit of a cold and I'm coughing once in a while. I don't want to cough in your face here, so I turn off my mic, or cough in your ear in any event. But this crown, as I was saying, is on display in the royal treasury in Vienna, well guarded behind a, a glass cage. I've been there and seen it myself. You can go there and see it. If you, if you can go there, you can see it in the royal treasury. And and the guards won't let you take a picture of it. Now, I got away with taking a picture of it because I read the sign that said no flash allowed. I read that to mean you just you couldn't use flash, but that you could take a picture without flash. 
And after I complained to one of the guards that, you know, you really can't get a good picture without flash. He says, you can't get a picture of that son at all. He said, young man, he said, um, I was much younger than us, about 30, 35 years ago I went there to see this crown. It's still there, still being well protected. He said, you can't take a picture of this crown at all. We will confiscate your camera if you take a picture of that. Now, at that time, digital cameras had not yet been invented or created, invented, and I took a picture with my uh, 35 millimeter camera with which I had slide film, film loaded, and it came out, but not quite as clean and clear as the picture you would get with flash. But anyway, this is a picture of the crown of the Holy Roman Empire. An official picture taken by the Austrian government. And this crown will be worn once again for its seventh and final time with the crowning of the beast. At that time, what will commence will be what Jesus Christ described in Matthew 24, verses 20, 21, 22, as great tribulation, mega trouble. Christ said it would be a time of trouble so great that no trouble since the beginning of the world to the present has ever been as bad as what's coming in this great tribulation. No, nor ever shall be. Nothing after it again. Nothing after it again shall be as bad as what is coming. It'll also This will also be the time that round three of world war commences. It'll be the time of the greatest martyrdom of God's saints, those who keep the Sabbath day, the seventh day of the week, and refuse <clears throat> and refuse to bow down to the image of the beast. Those people who are left behind during this time will be martyred for the sake of God's name and upholding, holding fast to the commandments and the truth. So these are God's people. They, uh, they could have escaped with Philadelphia at the beginning of the Great Tribulation, except for a lukewarm attitude that, that said, hey, we know it all, and they perhaps know more than perhaps some in Philadelphia might know, and yet they're not doing as Christ commanded us to do, as Philadelphia is noted for doing. And one of the main things is Luke 21, verse 36, where Christ said to watch the events. Let me come on out of this. After I just make mention, this will be the time of uh, God's two witnesses testifying for three and a half years. It'll be the time of, of uh, at the commencement of this, of Philadelphia escaping this tribulation by being uh, carried by God on the wings of Excuse me, I missed the mic switch at first there. You heard a little of my cough. It'll be the time when those who God considers to be Philadelphia will be flown on two wings of a great eagle to a place in the wilderness over just east of Israel in an area that you, could, you might say, as Dr. Hay put it, triangulates or is a tri-city area of the land of the children of Ammon, Edom, and Moab. That area <clears throat> is an area that God describes through Daniel 11, verses 40, 41, 42, as the only area that the beast who wears this crown you're seeing on your screen right now, it's the only area on the whole face of the earth that is outside the reach of the beast. It's protected by God, and that's the area where God will fly those who are accounted worthy to escape. That He promises in the latter part of verse 36 of Luke 21. Now, I go into more detail on that on the weekends on the Sabbath.tv channel. But uh, I wanted to make mention of those things here tonight, friends. And let's go on now to... Um, our next story, which uh, is kind of a, a story I think you'll find interesting. And then at the end of tonight's program, we have um, 
a story that relates to uh, a report being done on the flight MH17 that was shot down over the Ukraine. But first, let's cover this little interesting story. The wreck of a 600-year-old warship is thought to be to have been found buried in a river in South Hampton, England. The ship is what's called the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost or Holy Ghost. It was one of four great ships commissioned by Henry V, to, as you'll hear in this video, to help in his war against France. It was spotted in an aerial of the river Hamble by a historian. Duncan Kennedy reports. Taken more than 30 years ago, it was this aerial photo of the mud banks of the river Hamble that marks the starting point of this story, showing the spot where a legendary ship may be buried. The ship was the Holy Ghost, one of the key naval vessels of Henry V, built in 1415, the same year he fought at the Battle of Agincourt. For three decades, Dr Ian Friel has believed the aerial photo showed the exact location of the Holy Ghost, but he never had the money to act on his hunch. It's yet to be finalised, but yes, I would be absolutely delighted if we get the results saying that this was a ship that was um, rebuilt in 1414 and uh, uh, was the Holy Ghost, because it would be a great find. Henry V used the Holy Ghost in at least two battles to fight the French during the Hundred Year War. It seems incredible that one of the greatest warships of the Middle Ages could lie in the mud beneath my feet here. The team will now use sonar and other devices to carry out a much more detailed search. But if it is confirmed, then it could be one of the greatest maritime discoveries of recent years. Some are already comparing the finding of the Holy Ghost to the discovery of the Mary Rose, Henry VIII's warship discovered in the Solent more than 30 years ago. If these waters and this mud really are the home of this ancient vessel, an archaeological story that began 30 years ago can finally surface into life. Duncan Kennedy, BBC News, on the River Hamble. OK, thank you very much, Duncan. And uh, as he pointed out there, Henry V used the Holy Ghost for his battles. Now, Holy Ghost is another way, is the old archaic English way of saying the Holy Spirit. And for those of us who've been called by God, who are Christians, we use the Holy Spirit for our battles. But our battles are different than the battles of Henry V. Okay, all right, I'm finding that sore throat, friend, so I got, I got, got one last story for us tonight. <clears throat> Dutch investigators are to publish their report tomorrow into what caused Malaysian Airlines flight MH17 to crash in eastern Ukraine last year. The plane was flying from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur, and almost 300 people died when it came down near a, a certain little village that Tom Burridge in this report will tell us about. This is one of the main crash sites of flight MH17 where the fuselage of the plane came down and the lack of grass and the disturbed earth here is one of the few signs of what happened. Then there is the memorial stone to flight MH17 and the wording of it is overtly political because the pro-Russian authorities which control this territory describe the conflict in eastern Ukraine as a civil war. Ukraine rejects that and says this territory has been invaded by Russia. So from the very moment that flight MH17 was shot down, killing all 298 people on board, the truth about what happened has been shrouded in propaganda and political point scoring. The same field nearly 15 months ago. When the plane was shot down, the wreckage and the bodies of the innocent on board were scattered over 50 square kilometres of countryside. It was hard for Dutch and other foreign officials to reach the crash site. But now, finally, the Dutch Safety Board will publish its report. 
it will consider what caused the crash and look at the issue of civilian planes flying over conflict zones. It will consider why some relatives waited four days before the Dutch authorities confirmed their loved ones had died. And it will also report on whether those on board MH17 were conscious in the final moments. A separate criminal investigation is ongoing. Today's report will not look at who was responsible. On Russian TV, Russian officials criticise the investigators and blame Ukraine. And those who live by the crash site and watch, like Natalia, generally believe Moscow's version of events. The majority opinion among local residents is that a fighter jet was responsible, and only Ukraine had fighter jets flying over here. We filmed the Dutch-led team digging up pieces of bone ten months after the disaster, but they've been unable to find any trace of two of the victims on board. The relatives of the victims have waited so long for answers, but even before the report has been published, the Russian government has criticised the Dutch Safety Board, claiming that research by Russian experts has not been included. And remember, there's an even more politically sensitive criminal investigation and report due in a matter of months. Tom Burridge, BBC News, in eastern Ukraine. OK, eastern Ukraine. Tom, I was hoping you would pronounce the name of that little village spelled G-R-A-B-O-V-E for us, but eastern Ukraine. OK, that's where you are, that's where it is. All right, friends, that's it for this Monday night edition of Nightcast. God willing, and the creek don't rise. How come our buttons are not working again here? <clears throat> oh, I see it took. It's just not switching. Oh, and uh, we did a freeze frame. Well, I think you can still hear me, friends. I'm going to try to sign us off. What is holding up my buttons? Uh, well, okay. Well, I was hoping it would unfreeze. But, friends, uh, let me just try this, see if this will unfreeze it. No, we're pretty, pretty hung up. I hope I'm going to be able to play our... Uh, Show closer, <clears throat> since our buttons are are hung up. If not, maybe I'll just hung it, hum it for you tonight, <clears throat> and uh, hope that uh, appreciate any any of you want to pray for my uh, my throat. That hey, there we go. What happened? Okay, it's it's uh, it's about to crash on us completely. I'll just say thanks for joining us Monday Monday night. This Monday night, God willing, Creek don't rise, friends. We'll be back again. Tomorrow night, Tuesday night, with the day's current news related to the Bible and prophecy here on Nightcast. I'm going to hum that closing for you there. Um, <clears throat> no, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to say so long. We'll see you, God willing, tomorrow night. Thanks for joining us.